Great. Um, so welcome to another morning of the New Office Conference. And I started, I think I was started off to stay with a little quiz time about our beloved work of us. Don't let me get angry. Our beloved camel. Just in this case, copy constructs all the members. 
but we can't properly construct the land because the unique pointer doesn't, by design, for good reason, doesn't have a copy constructor. So what can the compiler do in this case? Was the wall to end? No, it just defines it as deleted. So you declare it as defaulted, and if then the contract can be um, implemented because there's no way to, to implement a copy constructor or a destructor or a default constructor because one of the members or one of the base classes doesn't have this operation. Then the compiler will just say, okay, you want it, I give it to you, but to define as the default is deleted, that's what happened. Exactly. If it can't implement it for you, then it just implements it as needed. Uh, yes? <laughs> Is there a difference between uh, defining and supported and just leaving it out? No, in this case not. There, there is sometimes a difference whether you have, um, so I'll come back to that later, when you have some of the special member functions declared in, in whatever way, then some other rules kick in, because they have to be many rules in C, otherwise it wouldn't be C. Uh, so there are some special cases, I'll come back to that later. Um, and I'll come back to this slide in a moment. Just one more question on this. Um, so we saw that um, to default something is normally to just declare it as defaulted and then the compiler kicks in and defines it as either a body synthesized or, or as deleted. But can a function also be defined as it, only defined as defaulted, not declared as defaulted? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Which is a good way to, to structure the code so you don't want to have the constructor inline because you want to have a stable API so you want to have this function to be called from the other library and not inline there. Um, so you, in, in the header, in the include file, you just uh, have a normal declaration of the, of the constructor um, and then in the, in the CXX file um, you can then say just insert here the defaulted uh, code for it and that works fine and that is, as I said, a, a nice way to not have to spell it out down there even if you want the constructor not to be inlined in your input. <coughs> the other way around, um, does that also work for deleted functions? Why not? Shouldn't. Why Shouldn't. Why not? No, it doesn't. A deleted function has to be declared as deleted or de defined as deleted on the first declaration. Full stop. <laughs> and it kind of makes sense because if the compiler will receive the input file, then it has no idea that it is deleted, so it would generate a call to that. And at the end time, the call would go to nowhere. So that would be the old trick of, in, in the old days before deleted functions, what we did was um, declare functions are never defined and, and the compiler will complain about the calling which is the link would and in this scenario we have the same. Um, so why did I ask about all this crazy stuff? Um, because um, and there Armin's question kicks in, is there a difference? I mean Matt's just coming away. <laughs> Is there a difference between having functions left out and completely implicitly declared or spelling them out and, and uh, even giving them uh, defaulted, um, running them as equal default? And if there is, um, so what the, what the standard says is that nowadays if you have any of these special member functions like a constructor or a destructor or a copy assignment operator or a copy, uh, copy constructor, then the other copy functions, the missing ones, so you just have a copy constructor but you don't have a copy assignment operator, then the copy assignment operator will implicitly get declared for you and implicitly defined as defaulted for you. Um, and if you have a destructor as well, 
for the roof operation, that for the unit edit, the rules are same. So if you have any special member functions, roof operations are deleted, and you need to explicitly define them as defaulted, um, which makes sense if you think about it. So if you have a destructor that does something special, then you probably want your roof operations to also do something special to, to not allow any moves. And if you have a destructor that does something special like deletes a member, then you probably also a member point and then you also don't want to have a copy constructor because um, you then double delete the member if, if you don't uh, take care. Um, so these old rules were seen as bad and um, these old rules are not deprecated. So whenever you have like a destructor, for example, your copy operations, copy constructor, copy assignment operator are still implicitly defined for you, but that will go away in future version probably for rather good reasons. So what GCC 9, the latest GCC version um, that is in the works now does is generate a warning for that. And with our warnings as errors enabled, we get an error for all these places where we have some of the member functions um, implemented and uh, the others kicking in implicitly. Um, so what I did with the code is I went through all that code. There are some places where there were bugs because we did one of those things but not the other, and there were real bugs working there. But in many cases, what we have is, for example, a class with a virtual destructor that is even spelled out here. But the rules now say that we have a virtual destructor or any sort of destructor um, that these special member functions will no longer um, um, be defined, implicitly defined as defaulted for you, but will be implicitly declared and deleted for you. So what I did is add all this water right here. It's um, just not we need more water. More water. Like in this case, we do, and it doesn't hurt to have them defaulted, but because as we see, uh, if, if this can't be, com uh, if, if, if we had a member that can't be copied, for example, then the copy constructor that we default here would just be uh, defined as needed. It's just dangerous if there's any members, like pointer members, if we then default move operations, then of course we will got double delete stuff, or or, or even if we. Um, Default uh, the copy operations. Why did you choose this structure? That's just an example of, of how the code of the we have a, we have a virtual base class. So to make it virtual, what we do is have a virtual destructor. If we now have any destructor, the implicitly defined functions will in the future no longer be defined or declared. So we need to take action now, and that's why we have to add some more that across the code base. So if you stumble across any of these, it's just to appease future compiler versions. We have to hurry to get all, through all the exciting topics. Next topic, inline. What's an inline function? Which is defined in the killer so that it can include multiple lines. It's not, not about implementing anything. It is more about having that one function defined in multiple places. So multiple translation units, as they are called technically, can contain the same definition. If the definitions are different, you're cheating and the compiler will not know that the the world will end in that case. So <laughs> don't do that. Um, Sorry? The, the linker wouldn't notice either because it doesn't cache in for the, in, uh, uh, a clever linker that does all program optimization that one might notice, but the non linker wouldn't. Because the, if you have the same signature of the function, just different bodies, then it doesn't know about that. Um, which is especially useful if these inline functions then contain, contain static. Uh, data because there's only one instance of the static data and for all the UI. So your counter function can be inlined in your include file and re return increasing values regardless of how you call them. That's an old trick. A newer trick is an inline variable. So what's an inline variable? 
or well, same band, can be defined in multiple translation units. What's that good for? Um, To avoid define exactly. So what we did with macros in the past, with macro definitions of, of uh, literal values, we can now do with const expert. And um, so if you have a static data member that is a const expert, like we have in some places, Node will just went through all the code and all the, all the strings that we use in as defined. Many of them are now changed into um, const expert static member data members. Um, and the trick with these is const expert for functions as well as for variables implicitly implies inline. So whenever you have something that is const expert, it is also inline. And inline variables are on C17. So before that, they were not inline variables, but they behave slightly differently. If you see on the next slide. And with an inline variable, this one is the definition already. So you don't need an outline. Extra definition for the for the memory um, that this the variable might need because the compiler now takes care of that same way as for the for functions. Good question. The static const expert is that reloaded? Aren't most experts static by definition? No, no, no. You can also have one static const expert. The const will be redundant. The const expert variable will also be const. But the static is not redundant. So what's in the next phase? No, you can relax. It's something completely different. We won't talk about that here. <laughs> <laughs> and um, what's the interesting thing about these um, inline variables? Well, as I said, we use them um, to have const expert static members, member uh, data members that we can now um, directly define in the body of the of the class. And in the past you needed before C17 you also needed to have a so this was only a declaration back then even if it had an initializer and you also needed to have a definition. In, in some cases, the compiler wouldn't know if it didn't have a definition. It wouldn't bark. In other cases, it would bark, or, or the lingo would bark. So, until we are not C17 clean across all the code base, in some places, um, especially if the, the literal is of some class type and not just of some integer type, um, we also have to have in, the, in some of the, the CXX files this incantation here. If we don't yet have uh, C++ inline variables, we also need to provide a, de a definition of this member. And once we move to C++ 17 completely um, and throw out all the old compilers, we can remove these lines. So we now have some special um, config variable that controls that. So if you stumble across this in the code or get a linker error for something for construct like a pair, remember to just in insert this implementation from now. Next topic, copy, move. C17, the this compiler. So we have a struct with a deleted copy constructor. Even if there's no const stick in there, it is deleted, so we just have one copy constructor implicitly defined, so this is the one, so it is deleted, so we don't get any other ones. So we can't copy the S object out of F. Yes. There is no copy happy there, so it should compile. It is invalid, exactly. Like, there is guaranteed copy division in C17, so this temporary thing there, this R value, gets directly created in the, in the space of the S that is initialized there. So this works now. Which is wonderful because we sometimes want to have factories for objects that contain uh, uh, unique pointers that we can't copy. So this this is why we, they, they made this work actually. And, and you can break it if you try to be smart and use to move on that paper. <laughs> That's the next slide. First of all, if 
before that Google Docker um, that compiles. Um, next one slightly different than this compiler. So the, the only thing we change is we first construct the S object here, down here in that S function, and then move it out. Does that work? And we still have the, the, the copy constructor uh, deleted. Doesn't it? Work? So there is still, by definition, this S object, which is an LW, has to be copied out of here. Even if the compiler is smart and does uh, uh, optimal copy divisions. So there's now guaranteed copy division in this case where the object is an R value. If the object returns and is an L value, there's optional uh, copy division, as has always been the case. But as has always been the case, even if this optional copy revision is done, the um, copy constructor still needs to be callable, which it isn't here. So there's still a subtle difference. So if you write these uh, factory functions, you need to make sure that the factory, what it returns, is the real object and not, not something that gets copied. Now, standard move, as I said. Um, if you insert a standard move here, is that good or bad? Bad. Bad, exactly. Why is it bad? Because it doesn't do any good, and in the worst case, it is bad. So, um, the compiler, and many of the compilers are smart enough to warn you here that we're doing a pessimizing move. So, what happens? Um, the return, the plain return S, would still be eligible for this opti optional copy edition that we saw in the, in the previous slide in the, in the lower part. The compiler might do that or it might not do that. So if it does that, then the plain return S is optimized. Uh, Non-plain return standard move S that adds some, some casting around the S, um, then the rule doesn't no longer kick in that this can be optimized now because the rules are quite picky. They are only a plain return of, uh, of some, some variable can be optimized. Um, so either we, we optimize that, the compiler is smart enough and optimizes it, but if it doesn't, then the standard rules might be useful. Now, the rules, tricky as they are, say, if the compiler doesn't optimize here, um, and we use the plain return S here without any standard move decoration, then the compiler must first try to do a move for you. So these are rather complicated rules, but in the end they do what we would expect, try to move it out as cheaply as possible for you. Uh, and that's the reason why sometimes such a standard move, if you add it, you would intend, but the compiler says no, leave that out, better leave that out, it won't do any good. So, um, next one. As long as we still have time for minutes. Um, this will go back. What do we do? Um, so we have a, a, a struct S again. We now have some, some other struct T um, that we want to return. And we have some um, a conversion constructor that can ta take an S and turn it into a T, and it takes it um, by R value reference, so it's a moving, a kind of moving thing, moving from an S to a T, and what we want to have in the end is a T. Um, so this good, bad, mediocre... Depends on the implementation of the movement structure? It is... Um, it's not really that bad as the other one, it's not a pessimizing move, but it still will give you warnings from some compilers that it's a redundant move. Because um, with the rules that have been adapted over uh, changed over time, fixed over time, I'll come to back, back to that. Um, if you just have to return S, yeah, the plain S, return S, that's again something special um, that allows to um, take this um, L value S and then treat it as an R value to directly move it into the, 
into the constructor. So whenever you see a return of just a variable and nothing else, no decoration around it, put, put parentheses around that's every that's all that's allowed. Um, then some special rules kick in and you implicitly automatically get this stuff moved. Um, so in this case it doesn't work except that it will generate with some compiler warning that then breaks or build again, but um, the compiler will tell you that this is redone and it can just be removed. Next one. The only change is we make that T constructor explicit. Is this a good or a bad one? Remove. Well, well it's, a, it's a very good one because if we leave that out, um, the compiler will complain. Of course, we can't. Um, we need to construct a T here and um, we need to explicitly mention T so we don't have a plain return S. We can't have a plain return S in any case because we need to explicitly tell or write down that we want to construct a T because the constructor is explicit and if we, if we leave out the T around it um, then it won't compile and if we don't insert the standard move then we have an L value here in the S that um, will not be moved so we're uh, pessimizing then and using a copy construction instead of a move so this is one of the uh, rare cases um, for rare example where, where, where the, Necessary. And the last one, just a few more slides. The last one of these moves. Um, slightly different situation again. We have a base class as one, we have a derived class as two. We have a base, we want to return the base in the base class instance. We generate um, derived class instance. Should we move that out or not? Should we do move or not? Um, it depends. What happens when we move the base class out? We take the base class object and invoke its move operation, whatever that does, it turns the object into some other state that is still safe, but um, where, where some members are probably in a state um, where they have lost their content because we moved it away. Now, if the derived class is fine with that, then everything is good. If the derived class is rather trivial and it doesn't depend on any state of the, of the base class, um, then no harm done if we just move some parts of the base, but the coffee derived class parts will be left untouched by this move. So we'll have an object in a rather Frankenstein state where the, the base class parts have been moved out and the derived class part think, still think, oh, I have a fully intact base class parts which is not the case here. So, you have to know whether this is good or bad. So the compiler, in this case, um, there's another special rule, because we would have a return S, plain return S without any decoration. So it would normally be eligible for a move, but then the compiler says, no, we, we change the type of that. What we, the move constructor that we would actually pick is not for S2, but it's for S1. And then it doesn't use that move constructor for you. So in this case, you have to decide for yourself. Move it, live with this Frankenstein temporary that has parts, only parts of it moved, uh, or, or use a copy. And uh, time will nevertheless tell you you, you better move. Um, so sometimes you might have to resist the warnings that plane generates, at least for now the latest versions, maybe later versions uh, will, will fix that problem. Um, yeah, it's the inner S2 destructor that is the problem. So the, the, the derived class destructor that happens in the class, you have moved out parts of it. Whatever the destructor then does. So if you have some special destructor body written there that depends on the inner class parts to still be there, then you will have a surprise wake up. Um, or the class was designed in a way that it doesn't care about the details of its base class members and then everything will be fine. It really depends on how you implement that S2 class. Um, so yeah, again, why do I ask? Um, because compilers didn't get the right um, either um, for some time, um, and 
and some things change and there's new routes, how um, things are done. Um, so there's some parts of the code um, where we have some special if that trickery again for now, um, because the rules for this for the second case where we have a that was for the S and the T, um, where we have different class that we move, different type that we move out. In the olden times, we didn't need to move in, in uh, fixed walls, times we don't need it. So we have some of these. And with the last example, um, it gets even worse because GCC, the latest GCC, has a bug there. Um, and and uh, even with the bug fixed again, it still generates a warning that is false. Um, so we have a rather big boilerplate there. And with this beautiful jungle on the wall, or not, I'll leave you again. See you.